Dear Professor van Grinsven, Martijn, dear guest, I wish you all a warm welcome to this academic ceremony, during which Professor Martijn van Grinsven will give his inaugural lecture in a moment. With this, he finally, I should say, officially accepts his chair as Professor of Regener Regenerative Medicine at Maastricht University, but it is not his fault that it took three and a half years between him joining this wonderful university and this official moment. But I will get back to that in a second. My name is Pamela Habibovic, and as the rector of Maastricht University, it is my honor to uh, lead this ceremony. It always is, but in this case, I feel it uh, even a bit stronger. Since I was a direct colleague of Martijn before assuming the role of rector. Actually, I was the one who called him uh, to tell him that he was selected for the position. And apparently, my introduction to that very message was so long that Martijn thought that he was rejected. Now, getting to the reasons why we had to wait for this moment a bit longer than is normal. First, originally the plan was to have this ceremony for Martijn half a year after his arrival in Maastricht. However, that April 2020, we just got to know COVID-19. Does anybody remember COVID-19? I suppose I don't have to tell you what uh, that meant for the ceremonies like this. Second, as most of you probably know, a bit later, Martijn's mom fell ill and sadly, she could not be cured. But as moms do, they try to nudge their kids a bit into directions that they feel are important to go. And so she made Martijn promise to still deliver this inaugural lecture one day. So today is that day. And although she's unfortunately not in the Ola physically, I am sure she's present in minds of many, and I'm sure definitely in yours. So here you are, and we are happy to have you in Maastricht University. Martijn came to lead the C-Byte department of the Merlin Institute in September 2019, after having built his career first in Leiden, then in Hanover, and finally at the Technical University in Munich. Martijn left the Technical University of Munich for us, where he had been the head of experimental trauma surgery for eight years. We were very pleased that, he could that we could seduce him to come here, and I would like to tell you a bit more ab about three of the many positive characteristics that made Martijn so very attractive for our institute as a new colleague. First, there was a strong focus on the clinical translation of regenerative medicine therapies to the clinic. Second, his never-ending energy and enthusiasm and last but not least, his ability to truly listen to others. These characteristics tie up together neatly, making a nice person like different tissues and organs in the body do. Martijn is interested in many things, but one of his true passions is the translation of laboratory research to patient care. For this effort to materialize, you need to step outside your comfort zone as a researcher. Listen to everyday challenges clinicians experience in the operating theater and collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. And indeed, we knew that back in Munich, he established many collaborations with clinicians. And as we hoped and expected, he did and does the same here in Maastricht. Soon after his arrival, he has found his way to, among others, clinical departments of orthopedics and trauma surgery at Maastricht University Medical Center. One of Martijn's recent pu publications revolves around a young man who had been in a motorcycle accident and as a consequence was left with an over 15 centimeters long defect in a long bone of his leg. This is a challenge for those of you who are not familiar with such a problem. To treat this clinically challenging defect, Martijn, together with colleague Martijn Puse, who is also together with us today, applied a still rather experimental regenerative medicine approach. This worked out successfully, which, as you can imagine, is a very satisfying achievement. And Martijn does not stop there. He's focusing on tissue regeneration, taking the challenges of the body as a system into account. For example, addressing the issue of poor vascularization, of a tissue during regeneration or the effect of immune system may have on regeneration. 
fascinate this all this fascinate him Martin is a problem solver colleagues say in the broadest sense of the word a huge dose of positivity and energy comes in handy with that the first and second impression of Martin is what an enthusiastic person what an energetic speaker by incorporating the patient's perspective in his talks, examples from the clinic, but also using his body language, as many of you will recognize, the work from the lab becomes real to many. This makes him not only a respected researcher, but also a great lecturer. Colleagues sometimes wonder how he maintains this energy, even at difficult times. Someone named Milo, um, seems to play a role here, but I'll get back to that in a moment. Maybe the better known factor in that is, of course, his wife, Elizabeth, who is now a professor in Aachen and closely collaborates with her husband in research. You both make a great couple inside and outside the university. And last but not least, the character trait that makes Martijn such a great colleague is his ability to listen. Not only, as I said, does he listen carefully to clinicians, which is sometimes not so easy, but also to his colleagues. He keeps a keen eye on the well-being of those around him. Young researchers can count on his full attention, and he gives everyone the credits they deserve. The only advice some of his colleagues expressed is that he should look after himself as well as he does after others. Now back to Milo the brown Labrador, who is so kind to share his house with Martijn and Elisabeth in Berg and Terbleit. Every morning, it is said, when most people snooze their alarms for one more time, Martijn and Milo make long walks in the beautiful nature of South Limburg. These uh, walks seem to be a prerequisite for staying healthy, for the dog, they say, but I'm sure also for the professor. With that, I would like to close by congratulating Martijn and all of you, your loved ones uh, around you on this special day. And with that, I would like to give a floor to you for your inaugural lecture, Could Humans Ever Regenerate? The Promise of Regenerative Medicine. Thank you very much. Pamela, hooggeleerde vrouw en rector, hooggeleerd cortege, lieve collega's, vrienden, pa, Elisabeth, thank you very much for, for being here today with me. Uh, it's really a fantastic day for me and it is also a difficult day, but I'm, I'm really happy to stand here today. As you see on the slide, it's the 17th of April 2020. And as Pamela already mentioned, this came in between. And then, this is the day of today. And as she also mentioned, this is my mother. And my mother was a fantastic woman. Yeah, she raised me and she was really incredible. And indeed, my mother was always telling two things. She was telling, als je hard werkt, dan zal het beloond worden. Yeah, so I tried. The second thing what she said, ook al ben je twee koppen groter dan ik, ik blijf je moeder. And that's what she said like three days before she died last year, where she told me, and you're going to do this inaugural speech, you know, and I will be there. So I'm very sure she is there. I'm also extremely grateful to all of you that are here or online or wherever, because I saw this morning the over 3000 euros has been gone to the fund that I was making in the KWF to, to raise money for a project for the for a treatment of the cancer she had, which she cannot enjoy anymore, but perhaps others in there will be able to enjoy. So in that sense, this inaugural speech is also certainly for my mother and she is certainly here. And as my father said this morning, look, she made even a little bit of sunshine. Also there, she seems to have a, somebody where she tells, I am two kopen, ook al ben je twee kopen groter dan ik. Je redt het, ik, ik heb het toch voor het zeggen. So where I was born is in Leiderdorp, a little village close to Leiden. And I went to Leiden, I went to the university, I studied there. And a person here in the room may recognize me or may not. Clemens van Blitterswijk. He was there. He was there in a barrack, in an in a outside place. And I was a student. 
and he taught how to isolate osteoblasts from Calvaria. You, you probably don't remember me that I was one of the students, but I forgive you for that. And that was very nice. And during my studies, I started to work a little bit next to the studies in the pathology department. I thought it was interesting. And there I was focusing on the kidney, on autoimmune diseases, kidney, what is happening in there. What is amazing is 1996, I come here and Vanessa Lapuente and Annika Schumacher come to me and say, oh, we're working on kidney. Do you want to take part in that? And I'm back to my kidney. That was just great to see how the circle actually closed. As Pamela already said, I went from the Netherlands to Germany for two years. They asked me to come there, set up a lab, and I said, okay, I go there for two years. Well, it went a little bit longer. It was the Medizinische Hochschule Hannover, um, in a hospital with uh, uh, an education also in there. And there, to my great surprise, in 2002, they uh, made me also professor. Yeah, I was at the moment the youngest professor there, and I was really humbled by that. Yeah, and I, I was giving also a talk like this, but completely different. I come a little bit later to that. From Hanover, I moved to Vienna, a beautiful city, very nice. And there, I really got more into valorization, in things, what can you do with regenerative medicine? How can you get there? Because here I was involved in setting up with the Red Cross in Linz, which is a town a little bit more to the north of in Austria, to set up a lab for a big GMP. That means that is something that is really important to getting cells to a patient that everything is safe. So this safety lab, yeah, I was able to help with, and it was really nice. I was supposed to stay there a bit to take over, but circumstances made that it was not possible. So I moved to Munich, stayed in the German language, yeah, and what you saw there, I went to the trauma surgery, experimental trauma surgery, as Pamela already alluded to. And then in 2019, indeed, the call came, and I was thinking, oh, how she started? Yeah, we have been speaking about it and about you. And I was like, okay, this is it. But I was extremely lucky to be the one. Because, as you can see, the building is much nicer. You saw the other pictures, the old gray buildings. No, this is a very nice building. So I came for the building, not completely. And I came to a team. And Pamela and also Lorenzo at that time told me, yeah, well, here's your team. And you start with that. Berta was not there yet, but I had already Vanessa and Art. And it was a great start. It was really nice. I felt really welcomed by them. Yeah, and that made me immediately feel home. Even if I'm from Leiden, and Maastricht for me was always holiday, right, Pa? We always went there. Yeah, and on the other side, it was far away. You know, it's, you have to go all the way to the south of the Netherlands. And then the 29th of October, one floor up, yeah, I went to Rianne together with Henny Beckers from Ophthalmology, where we signed the official letter for professor, which gave a fantastic feeling. And then, as I said, I planned my inaugural speech. I had already one in Hannover. Yeah? And there I spoke about rollende Granulozyten nach Trauma, Holland in note. The Germans found it funny, yeah? Yeah, because that's a saying there. Yeah, and I'm from Holland, so, yeah. There I spoke about white blood cells, how important they are for trauma. Yeah, they are the warriors. They make that when something went wrong, when you have an injury, yeah, they come and they take care of bacteria that are in there, etc. And how funny, this was about 1999, 2000, uh, 2002, sorry. This was 2002. And what is so funny, I'm here, I'm meeting Taco Blockhuis, Martijn Puse in trauma. What is Taco's most favorite cell? The granulocyte. So I'm back to my granulocytes again. I had another inaugural speech, also in Germany. There I looked at steroids, differences in between men and, uh, and, and women, how steroids can influence that. And also here, again, now, years later, I'm looking at bacteria, I'm looking at differences. 
So you see, there's always a circle of life in everything we do. And now here today, I'm standing here and I'm speaking about regenerative medicine. Somebody of you just asked me, what is regenerative medicine? Well, regenerative medicine is actually trying to push the body to do what it should do, namely regenerate, making something new. Yeah, a lot of physicians always think, oh, I am the healer. Well, actually, sorry, you are not. The body itself heals. We just can help the body heal. And it started already years ago. Prometheus. Prometheus was in the Greek mythology a person that started to make persons from clay. He made the woman, he made the man. And when the woman and the man were there and the people were there, yeah, he came to Zeus, the, 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 the head god, and was telling, look, yeah, here I have a lot of food. And he kind of buried a good foot below it and made two piles and say, you can choose. Yeah? And Zeus was thinking, oh, you're trying to trick me. And because of that, he punished him. He, he put him to a mountain and every day came this bird and eat his liver. And the liver was regrowing, regenerating. So already in that time, there was regeneration. And when we look in nature, we have fantastic regenerators. We have the axolotl, which is an animal, which is a salamander. And the salamander, yeah, when the, when the leg goes out, it just regrows. Wouldn't that be fantastic? Yeah? Somebody has an accident, loses his arm, yeah, goes to Martin Puzer in the hospital and says, don't have to do anything, and it just regrows. Yeah? It's unfortunately not like that. So, in research, we are trying to think of that. What can we do? What can we do to help the body regenerate? And when you look in the literature, you come always to the triangle, the tissue engineering triangle, TET. And there are different forms of this triangle. But when you look closely, everybody has something like cells, Everybody has something like a scaffold, a material. I come later back to that. And everybody has something to push these cells to make whatever tissue you like. In the upper part, you see a fantastic triangle. And that is what I feel in Maastricht is really lift. That is the interdisciplinarity. When we do research, you cannot do research by yourself. Even if you have a team around you, they have your ideas, perhaps. What you need is people that look different to the problem. You need a cell biologist. You need a biochemist. You need a material scientist. You need a physician. Yeah, perhaps you also need a social scientist yeah, that is thinking of like, yeah, but how is it with the patient? So this triangle is a lot of things together. So I'm perhaps a bit too scientific. Let's, let's go to make it really understandable. So what we need, and I like to camp, I like to go in RV or with a caravan around. What we do there is we have a Dutch oven. That's a pot, we put it on the fire and we cook. And in this Dutch oven regenerative pot, we have three things. We have cells, we take it from the patient, and we need a structure. When you build a house, like what you see up here, you need a structure, otherwise your house just falls apart. And the third thing you need is some pokon. Yeah? Your house needs to grow, your plant needs to grow. So that is what we are going to see today. And we are going to see also the patient that Pamela referred to before. So you need something to tell yourselves, hey, come on, you need to grow, you need a house, yeah, the base of it, and you need cells. And with that, we are trying to make organs. We are trying, yeah, that we make new organs. Yeah, the title of my inaugural speech is Could We Ever Regenerate a Human? I come to the end of that if that's, if that's possible. But let's start with organs. Are we able to do that? And my interest is really in the musculoskeletal system. That is bone. There we have cartilage, 
there we have muscle tissue. But what we also have is tissues that work together. Right? Because your cartilage needs to sit on your bone. Your muscle needs to be connected to your bone. Let's look at bone. Bone, when it's like this, it's fine. But sometimes accidents happen. It breaks, you get all kinds of inflammation, and it starts growing together until you hope that it is again nicely grown together. But sometimes, very unfortunate, the gap is way too big. And you already see it here. There are two bridges, but they don't make it. The people don't make it to get to the other side. There will always be a gap, even if you try so hard. The people are afraid, stop on the one end, on the other hand, and they don't make it. So we have a huge gap there. And there we try to fill that gap. And we researchers try to fill that with all kinds of materials. And I'm not a material scientist. That is Pamela, that is other people in the lab. That is the interdisciplinarity, what I'm telling you. We need to work together. We need other people and look for that. And there we have what we call scaffolds. That is the structure of your house. That is that wire thing that I showed to you, yeah, which you see again here nicely up in the corner. So here we are making the structure yeah, where we really make something. And when everything is well, what you then can see, then here in red is bone that can grow into it. That is what we want. But it is not that easy. Because this structure is like a house. And what you see here on the right hand side are different houses and different beds. This here is a fakir. He is lying on nails. Do you think that cells like to lie on nails? Well, I don't think so. So if you make something, if you make a biomaterial, and that are nails, you put your cell on it, your cell dies. He doesn't like it. Moreover, some cells, some tissues like to be lot together. They like to be in a sport hall, everybody nicely together, nice, warm, cozy, fantastic. So that is so for some tissues, perfect. Other tissues, however, do not like that. They want to be solitary on a mountain. Nothing for me. I don't get up there, but okay. So we have material to fill the gap. The second thing we need are cells. We have cells and we have stem cells. Stem cells are the mother cells. You may not remember, but for me it was about 49 years ago, there was a romantic night between my father and my mother. And there was a one stem cell. And this stem cell now is me. So out of this little one stem cell came a lot of other cells. And those cells we want. We want this mother cell to find and to let new tissue grow. And for that we need machines like this. Here we have M&Ms in all kinds of colors. Yeah, and this machine makes blue M&Ms, yellow M&Ms, brown M&Ms in different boxes. And that is what we try to do with this machine. When I was in Munich, I worked a bit together to see if we can have better markers to find the cells. Which are the right cells? So we have cells. We have this house. And now we put them, bring them together. So what we typically do in the lab is we take the cells and we poof, put them onto the scaffold. Yeah, you see them, you see them falling down. And what we want is that these cells start walking around, that these cells go into your house, that they go to the bathroom, that they go to the bedroom, they go to the attic, they go everywhere. Because the whole house needs to be maintained. You want to make bone, you want to make a new bony house, right? So what you want is that your cells walk around, go in here. But that's not that easy. And it's also depending on what you have. Here you see a very bad thing. You see only, it walked only up to here. 
in those other type of pores, other type of material, they woke. They said, yeah, fantastic. I go to the kitchen, get to the beer, right? That is what is making here. So very good, very nice how it worked out. So we have our house, we have our cells, and now we need some magic. And that is the pokon. We need something that stimulates our cells. And uh, Peter ten Dijk is here from Leiden and he has one specific marker, one specific thing also for cells that he tell become bone cell. Yeah? You can put that on it yeah? and the cells may start to get growing. Sounds easy? It's not that easy. We are still working on that. And especially also together with Elizabeth, we are looking at other means of doing that, of telling ourselves, please become bone, right? So, but that is what we need. So we have a house, we have our cells, and we have some magic that makes that we can grow bone. And then I come to the clinic and we start speaking. And then together with Martijn Puse, yeah, we started to try to make something for those patients. The patient that Pamela was speaking about, that had a huge gap, where normally we would say, I'm very sorry, we amputate. So we speak, we meet in 2019. He is also called Martijn, so that was a connection we had. Yeah? And then we start thinking, okay, he has the patient. He has an image. He shows me this image. He said, look what a gap I have here. It's a big gap. And I said, well, I have cement, I have cells, and we have some magic dust. And he said, let's try it. And that is also something that's fantastic because that you don't find often. I have had this idea for a long time. You saw when I started, but, but sometimes it's difficult to bring that to the clinic because it's, you know, it's also a risk for the clinician, right? The clinician also needs to trust me that all the work we did in the lab is indeed okay. So there is an amazing amount of trust that we have together, that he trusts me and I trust him that he will bring it to the clinic and that it's going to be well. So we have this patient, we make in the computer the design to fill up the gap exactly. Then we send it to a company because of course it needs to be made completely sterile, etc., etc. We get a test. We say, well, we are sitting there in his office with coffee yeah, and cookies and saying, yeah, this looks great. This is nice. So we say to the company, yes, make it. And then it comes and then we start to implant. This is the patient. You can see a huge gap, 15 centimeters. So he puts in some cement just to fill it up that it doesn't collapse. Yeah. And then we get this cage. We get this, this, printed, this printed house. And what you see so nicely here, all these holes in there. You remember? There's where the cells want to go in. The cells want to nicely sleep in these little holes. Yeah. And they want to walk from up and down to left and to right. So. We have that, we have our cage, and for the ones that do not like blood, there comes one bloody image. I was told when you do something with surgeons, you need to have always one bloody image. So this is the surgery. So here we see the huge gap. Here we see Martijn Puse. Here in white, what you can see here is the, is the house fundament. It's the basis of the house. It's what is printed, which are the holes in there, the beds of my cells. What you see here is the cells and some of the magic pokon dust. What you see here is that we do that in the operating theater. We would love to do this outside. We would love to take the cells. We would love to take this printed thing. We would love to take the pokon, do it in a lab, look at it and say, Martijn, do you think it's working? And he's telling me, oh yeah, that's great bone, right? And then going to the OR and telling, yes, now we implant it. Unfortunately, the law is not like this. The law doesn't allow to do that. That's too difficult. You know, 
three things together, yeah, then they are that's way too difficult. So that's not working. So what we need to do is in the OR mixing everything together. And that is still the, the difficulty, the problem. Yeah? If we could do it outside, we could do tests, we could say, are the cells working? Is the magic dust working? Is the printed house working? But we cannot. So I really hope that in the years to come, we can bring it to something that we can do it really outside and bring it back. That is my dream also still of regenerative medicine. But we did this. And what you can see here, after one year, it is completely filled. It's perhaps not, still not the nicest bone. You see still some holes in here from the screws, but the bone healed. And here's the patient walking. He couldn't walk before. He was about to amputate. And that was so fantastic. And then Martijn and I, and it was like second Christmas day 2020, yeah, where we were in RTL uh, uh, Edith CNL. Yeah, where we could tell about it and we got really good, uh, good, pe uh, good comments on it. Yeah, and then we thought, well, perhaps we should do something nice together. Yeah, Martijn and Martijn, M&Ms, right? Yeah, perhaps, yeah, we are a good team. We are really, yeah, it really worked. Look, the patient, yeah, it healed very, very well. And that is what I mean. That is what in Maastricht and together with the MUMC was for me so valuable. Yeah, we have the researchers, we have the clinic and they come together. They need to speak with each other. And I think that's, that's really a wonderful thing. There's only a bridge in between. Unfortunately, the doors close at seven, but otherwise you can just go back and forth and we listen to each other and we, we need to trust each other. And I think that is, that is the amazing thing in Maastricht, what you really feel there. Yeah, you have the scientists, you have the clinicians, and they work together. And it's not only with Martijn Puse, because I do that for the bone. But I've, in the three years that I'm here, I may have met wonderful people. We are doing, we are doing something with obstetrics. Uh, we, are, we are doing something with ophthalmology. That is super nice, because it's really that people trust each other, work together. Yeah? And it's almost kind of a like, yeah, movie stars, we are going forward. But of course, we are thinking on. We have already a very difficult part here. We have here this huge gap. But what we also know is that people are not always completely healthy. We have older people that have osteoporosis, where you have brittle bone, where your bone is getting very, uh, very pudding. Yeah, you get cancer, you get osteosarcoma. Yeah, yesterday, one year ago, my mother had a metastasis and she broke her femur and she had such a huge gap and I couldn't fix it. And I'm still very sad about it, that we couldn't do anything for her there. And although I'm researching on that. But what is osteoporosis? Well, osteoporosis, when you have a bone in your bone, you normally have two types of cells, cells that break down bone, they eat the bone. And you have cells that make new bone and they must be in balance. And when they are in imbalance, as you can see here on the right hand side, your bone is broken down, you lose bone. And that goes gradually. And where we are now looking at is, it's nice that we have our cells, it's nice that we have our house, it's nice that we have our magic dust. But what I want to know together with my team is what is happening in the cell, what is happening there, what makes it really uh, going bad, and can I use that to make it go good again? And that is something that is called microRNA. Oh, it's a difficult word. MicroRNAs. I'm going to show you how that works. Normally in your cell, you have here this long strain where you start to make protein. You start to make uh, here, in here, a little protein what you need you need protein for your bone to make bone yeah so it is a bone protein and here is the micro RNA you see already how it comes out of the dark lurking yeah going there searching for this mRNA that makes actually good protein yeah and then it's going to be a bad guy mostly 
Yeah, because this microRNA is then going there, yeah, going to this nice piece of genetic code that makes nice bone protein. Yeah, but it comes there and then it starts to get to that part and to eat it away. And suddenly we don't produce our good protein anymore. You can see it here. It's sitting there together, yeah, and it's not working anymore. So we are interested in this bad guy that is sitting on there and making that I don't make my good protein. Because when I don't make my good protein, my gap cannot be filled. Yeah, so that is with the moment where we are working on. And we know they have all funny names, they have funny numbers. Yeah, they give numbers from 1 to 1800 at the moment or so. Yeah, and this, and here we see everywhere in the bone process we have these numbers. Everywhere they do something with my protein, making it bad. So we are at the moment thinking also in fractures, looking what is happening there. Is there something that I can then say, I take it out and suddenly I have good bone again. So what I think for us in regenerative medicine, what is super important is to translation. That is my, really my conviction. We need to look at the patient. What is wrong? What goes wrong in there? What is the problem? Then take that to the lab. Start making like crazy think of what can we do? And this triangle is always in your head. And we start looking, we are going deep. And of course, not alone, we need teams. And that is so fantastic. In Merlin, we have so many different people, we have so many different teams, but outside Merlin also, we use other, uh, working with other departments. We're using with clinicians. Yeah, we have fantastic. We are, we are having European networks. Great. Because what we want to do is really making this bridge where we have the lab work, where we have the clinic. And I told you, it's only a small bridge really in here between us, Maastricht University and the MUMC. We have this little bridge in there and that goes there. So I think I owe you an answer. Could humans ever regenerate? Well, completely, I'm doubtful. I don't think so. If you also want that, I'm also doubting. However, I'm very sure that we can regenerate parts. You saw we can regenerate bone. Others can regenerate heart patches. Others regenerate uh, liver. There are a lot of things. Some people can start regenerating um, islands of Langerhans. Yeah? So we have a lot of things we can already regenerate, the little parts that make it functional. And I think that's good. When we then go for complex structures, we need more research. We need to go in depth and look what is in there. But perhaps one day, like here in Blade, yeah, we indeed can just regenerate the arm like that. That's a lot of research. My conviction is, actually, that you also need education. You need to educate people, because otherwise people don't understand what you're doing. Not the clinicians, not the scientists, not the broad public. So we need to educate. My wife, as many of you know, is Cuban. And when you look at that world, the Cuban world, Latin America, yeah, we are so lucky sometimes that we were born here. Yeah? The people are happy there, but they have also problems because it's not always easy also not to work in there. So what we did, we went to Peru and we went every second year there, every uh, second year to give a course on regenerative medicine. And I can tell you that was so fantastic because those people, they come from young to old, old professors there. They came and they were really interested and they tried to really bring it to the practice. Yeah, and that was so rewarding to see, yeah, even if the means are perhaps not there. Yeah, they try and together we could go somewhere. And that was amazingly to see. And that was really rewarding to get there. The same we went to Cuba. Yeah, there are a lot of biomaterial scientists there. They take the sand of the beach yeah, and they make something great out of it. They make something out of it, a bioglass, fights infection and that make new bone. Fantastic, yeah? 
from the Cuban beach, what you normally would just think, ah, I lie there nicely and I'm just yeah, having a great time. So from those countries, we can also learn. We can learn and we should work much more together. I was also in Argentina. And this person had fantastic zebra fish. He had made all kinds of zebra fish yeah, that were also starting to light up when they start to make bone. So when we gave our magic dust to that, the fish started to light up. I have never been able to so nicely see that. And that was a, a super collaboration and we are still collaborating on that. Yeah? So just look over the border. Just don't stay in Maastricht University. Don't stay in the Netherlands. Don't stay in Europe. Go abroad and look there. And what I also think is you should start with the children. You should start to teach the children what is science. And this was a scary one. Look at, them, look at how many little children are sitting there. And they are sitting there and were listening to me and they were asking questions. And some of those questions I tell you, I've never heard from a student here. There I was like, oh wow, I need to think about the answer. Yeah, because they are simple questions, but very hard to answer. And that is really also opening your eyes. So you really should stood start early on. But as I said, that everything, I'm standing here now, I'm talking to you about regenerative medicine, but that's absolutely not me. It's the team. It's always a team effort. You have to have good people in your team, different people in your team, multidisciplinary. And that is so what is the strength. And that is what also in Maastricht, I think, is super nice. Because when I came here, I come to the Netherlands, to my home country, but there are not much Dutch people in the group. And that makes it rich, that makes it fantastic. And I really would like to thank a lot of people. And I for sure are going to forget a lot of other people. I would like to really to thank Pamela, Lorenzo and also Clemens that trusted me when I was there in Munich and I applied, yeah, that they said, yes, we think you can do it. You th I think, we think you fit to the team. Yeah, and when I'm now here, I said, yes, I feel myself fitting to the team and that makes it a really good, really good feeling. My department, the PIs in my department, yeah, even though Art is working on type 1 diabetes, Vanessa is working on a lot of cell things and ophthalmology, Aurelie is doing computational modeling. The first time I was in her group, I was like, whoa, all those formulas, what is that? Not a clue, yeah? But I learned a lot. Fantastic, just to see this interdisciplinary. I never thought about that. And she really opened the eyes for computational modeling for me. And then Berta, she came a little bit later. She has joined the, the, the department a year ago. And she's doing a lot of proteomics and things. And a lot, she comes like, oh, I found 1500 proteins. I'm like, whoa, yeah. But her thing is cartilage, yeah. And we also started to work really well together. But it's not only small. All the other PIs, yeah, I want to thank you all. Yeah, because every one of you made me feel home made me feel nice in Merlin, yeah? Even if we have departments, we are Merlin, we are, we are one, and that feels extremely good. And then you have, of course, other people that are often also forgotten, I think. People that do a lot of work in the background, yeah? The upper row, the lab managers, yeah? They keep the labs running. It's not me that is going there, taking care of all those things. Here you see the office managers. Angelique is, was with us, yeah? I think she's there, yeah, she's there, very nice. Yeah, and now we have Francisca, you got the, the invitation of her, yeah? She was so enthusiastic, and then we spoke about promotions and boekje. And she was asking me, what is a boekje? I said, well, a boekje is when you do your PhD, you make a boekje. She said, that sounds a bit silly. I said, well, here's a boekje. Then I explained a bit. The next day she comes to me and she's telling me, I read a, I'm reading a book here. I said, oh, really? She said, yeah, my grandfather, he made a book here. 
and I'm reading it. Yeah? And the grandfather was like, wow, where comes his interest? And there you see a completely different person, completely different background. But when we speak and we come together, yeah, something nice comes there. The lower row you see here, all people of finance. And I really want to point that out. Here is Seth. I've been doing 23 years, a lot of research. I have been leading institutes, writing grants. Yeah, I was the one that was figuring out, oh, I need here 0.15 FTE. I need here this, oh, and that. Oh, I can perhaps here going back and forth. They are doing that for me here. My mouth fell open. I was, this is amazing. Yeah, I can, I don't have to focus anymore on, on the euro sense. They are doing that for me. And then we speak every three months or so. Yeah, and then Wesley has all his, all his tables. Yeah, Natalie is the one overseeing also things. Yeah, and then Noor always making it that we always can have really the right appointments and everything. So I really would like to thank also these people. Yeah, because they, perhaps they don't do science science, but they are extremely important. And then my team. Postdoc, Virginie, Nadia, also a, a highly important uh, technician, skilled person, yeah, has a PhD, really dedicated to the work. And all the, my PhD students in here, some just started, some are already going in the assessment committee, yeah, but they are really the ones that make my week starting fantastic. At nine o'clock in the morning on Monday morning, we have our meeting. And they tell me what they did last week. And that makes me forget all the bureaucracy and all the things. Yeah? And there I get enthusiastic. Look, I have a Western blot here. What do you think? Look, I found microRNA 125. Wow, fantastic. And that makes that I can start my week, even perhaps it's a heavy week. Yeah, that makes my, my week start with a smile. And all those people, they make me smile. All of Merlin. Yeah? You are the ones that really make it a nice environment. You make that I, I happily go there, yeah? that I feel welcome, I feel warm, yeah? and I feel really we are a family. And of course, in every good family, you have some problems. Yeah? But we really stick together, and I think that that is really fantastic. I would also like to thank Annemie. Unfortunately, the dean, she is unfortunately ill. She would have been here today. And Steph Kramers. Every year we sit together, or every other year, but every year they read something of me, yeah, and help the development. And that is nice, yeah. We really have a dialogue, yeah. That is really something that is extremely nice. That here you're not the professor, you're left alone, but you have persons to speak with. And then, of course, the collaborators. Chris Evans, knowing him for 26 years, a UK person living in the States. We do everything with him. He is so trustworthy. He is fantastic. And he is still telling me, you forgot the Oxford comma again. Martijn Puse, Taco Blockhuis. Every week on Thursday we go there. Every week they ask me, did you bring cookies? Yeah. Next time I bring M&Ms, Martijn. Peter Eemans from the orthopedics department. We meet often, we, we really spar, we think about out of the box, what, what is the politics, how can we bring things to the clinic. Tim, Tim Wolves, we had have two, two things together. One is, we wrote for GRIP, yeah, that is, that is a, a group of people together looking um, at obstetrics, uh, embryology, etc. And we wrote together with, with five other people, the research line. And that was so inspiring. That was so nice. We're sitting there together in his office working on that. The second thing, he do sepsis in sheep. I was flown back to 1996 where I did sepsis in sheep. Yeah? And again, I found, found a circle. I said, wow, this is the circle. This is great. And two German friends, Markus Huberlang. He is doing a lot of immunology. He's in Ulm. A fantastic friend. We have done a lot of research together, still doing, and always there, even in hard times. And Frank Hildebrand. Frank was my very first PhD student in Hanover. And he's now the head of trauma surgery in Aachen. 
just around the corner and we have had always contact. And that is so, so nice to see that over the years we keep the contact. He, he is going to be there tonight. Uh, the medical director wanted him today for some, some meeting, unfortunately, but otherwise he would have been here. I want to end with two slides. One, my parents. Without them, I would not have been here. My father is a hochspannings-electrician. My mother was a nurse for ha on the house. So she went from house to house and, and helped people. And they, when I started to study, they didn't have much money, but they made that me and also my sister could really study. Yeah? And without their efforts and they telling, when you want to do it, we support you. The same for my sister. Yeah? I would not have been here. Yeah? We were the first ones in our family that started to study. But we did it because of them, because they believed in us. And also my sister, she's always there. And unfortunately, can, she cannot be here today. Yeah? But those were really the basis. But I really want to end <clears throat> with the most special person in my life. As Mia Morsita, my wife. She goes to dig and dun with me. Yeah? She is really mein alles. And that's how we speak at home. We speak German, Dutch, English and Spanish. Just a complete nonsense. People from the village, yeah, they sometimes think, I don't know what those people are telling, but you know. And she is telling, I don't understand Maastricht. Well, but we get it. Elizabeth, you are really the one that make my life. Yeah? With you, yeah, it would not be fun. Not personally and not in the work. We have had hard times, but we have had fantastic times. We have tried to regenerate a little person that didn't work out but the two of us are super happy together yeah and that is what is really counting and Pamela already mentioned here's Milo that is the one that it is ik heb gezegd dank u wel Well, what is there left to say after such beautiful words? Thank you very much, Professor van Grinsven Martijn. Uh, I, I realized while listening to you is that everything I said in the introductory uh, part was really not necessary because you showed everything, your enthusiasm, your ability to listen, to collaborate, uh, I guess also your love for just people around you. How many times you said this, this, this is a beautiful person. And I think really this says something about you. So. We are happy again to have you here. I speak on behalf of the entire board and also of the board of the hospital. We are pleased to have you here. We are also very happy that you are with us, not only for research, but also and maybe in particular for education, because the way you are able to explain things with M&Ms and uh, with, uh, with all kinds of movie stars and magic and powder, and I'm sure that many little kids will, are, are happy to listen to you. So we also hope that we will see you uh, in, uh, in many of the educational activity of our university. So with that, uh, we have come to the closure of this ceremony. And I was asked to uh, ask you to first put, uh, ha have the cortege leave the room. Uh, and I can't help but notice that the entire cortege is male, with the exception of myself. So um, before we entered, I asked Martijn whether that was coincidence, whether women were not invited. And he said, <laughs> and, he, and that was a joke because I, am, I know Martijn and I'm, I'm sure he invited them. He said, well, maybe then do, they don't like me. So also on behalf of all the female professors, I would like to tell you they do like you, but they probably could not make it today. So with that, please allow the cortege to leave and congratulate Martijn first. And after that, he said that he would like to mingle with you. So don't queue up, just you know, go around and have a chat and I'm sure you will get the opportunity to congratulate him. With that, I would like to thank you very much for coming today today. And um, with that, I close this academic ceremony. Thank you. My name is Arsenio.